Any early like reflections to... that you have on those? Yeah. So would you like me to go through the results? Yeah, yeah. While we're getting okay. Steve coming back, any reflections you've got would be great. Yeah, so it looks like we have answered the poll. So let me go through it. So the first question is, and again, as we go through this, sometimes there's no correct answer, but it's an opportunity for us to talk about things and, and discuss it. So anyway, but the first question, it, it sort of gets at the theme of the course and what's the purpose of the course? <clears throat> Why are we doing this? And um, so one of the uh, is to this for us to exercise agency to be able to take control of your recovery process. And what's the um, the third big goal? And so the options are reach extinction, give back, or compliance. And so far in the answers we have, two people have said uh, reach extinction. Seven people have said uh, give back. And uh, three people have said 100% uh, compliance. Now, for me, the right answer is to give back. That, that's what we're trying to accomplish with the this uh, seminar, with this semester. <clears throat> but certainly, reaching extinction is a good goal in treatment. And being 100% compliance is a very important factor in reaching extinction. But... For the purposes of this course, what we're trying to do is to learn some information so each of us can go out and help teach other people a new model of addiction. And what's that new model? Well, the second question is, in an addictive cycle, the behavior to consume blank after the reward, and the options are increases or decreases. <clears throat> and we think the correct answer is increases, that that's a fundamental, a cardinal feature of addictions is that addictive cycle that engaging in the behavior increases the need to engage in it more. So it increases one's motivation. So we think that's a cardinal feature of all addictive behaviors. Okay, and the third question is a cardinal feature of all addictive behaviors is psychosocial adverse consequences. No one said that where use of a drug increases the motivation to use more of it. Uh, 11 out of 14 people uh, endorsed that. Uh, physical symptoms of withdrawal, no one endorsed that. And tolerance to, uh, to the drug, one person endorsed, endorsed that. An increase in dopamine and nucleus accumbens, two people endorsed that. So I think the best answer is a vicious cycle where use of a drug increases the motivation to use more of it. So why are these other <clears throat> items not the cardinal feature? So for psychosocial consequences, you can get psychosocial consequences like a DUI or fighting with your spouse or not doing well at your job for a variety of reasons besides addiction. So often that's a consequence of, of the addiction, not the cardinal feature, the necessary and sufficient condition to have a, a addictive condition. Vicious cycle. I believe that is the cardinal feature of addiction. And that's so important to keep in mind that when you ask yourself, am I addicted to something? The question is, after you engage in it, are you more likely, are you uh, more motivated to do more of it? And we contrast that with natural rewards. Again, if you're hungry, after you eat, you're less hungry. There's less motivation to eat. But if you do a hit of cocaine, you're more motivated to do more cocaine. And, and that's a, uh, a feature of all addictive drugs. And I would even say all addictive behaviors, that cycle where use of a drug increases the motivation to use more of it. And physical symptoms of withdrawal. So that's a, a good one because in the old days, in the old DSM-4, people used to find addiction as um, that you had to be physically dependent on something. And that would be manifested by either withdrawal or tolerance. And if you didn't have that, then you didn't have addiction. And um, that sort of was a problem because certain substances like, for example, cocaine, don't produce much in the way of physical withdrawal, but clearly a person was addicted to it. And so they got rid of that. Actually, that was part of the DSM-3 criteria. And then that was dropped. And that's, a again, a feature of some people who have addiction, and I would say usually that's in more the later stages of addiction, but not the necessary and sufficient condition to have an addictive uh, 
have an addiction, to be a part of that addictive cycle. And then the, the uh, question of increases in dopamine and nucleus accumbens. And that's a really interesting question because it does seem to be the, the case that all drugs that lead to addictions have in common the property that they do increase dopamine in the nucleus accumbens. But I put that item in there to really contrast that addiction is not physiology. There's no such thing as an addictive neuron. There's no such thing as addictive nucleus accumbens. These are manifestations. These are physical uh, me mechanisms to explain the addictive behavior. You can have an addicted person, but you can't have an addicted neuron. And that's, that's so important because in this uh, seminar, I really want to contrast sort of this mechanism some quasi-medical view of addiction is just a brain disease from the notion that it's a behavioral disease. It involves learning. So I think we can end that. Again, I'm open to debate, to questions, comments. Uh, this is an interactive process. And, and uh, for me, it's so much fun when I get to uh, interact with people and get their feedback and, and to see what they think. So I, I guess I can stop sharing this. Yeah, I think you can stop sharing it. The one thing that I noticed though, there seems to be a little bit of confusion over the issue of whether it's learned behavior or a brain disease. And I think you just mm -hmm. covered it, but just to put a fine point on it, what you're really saying is, in this in this sense, the brain disease is some pathology that you could see under a microscope, okay, something that you would be that's visible. And so while the maladaptive behavior might appear to be a, a form of a, a diseased brain, if you will, it's not a, not something you can slice and put under a slide and look on a microscope and see it. Yeah, that's right. That's so the, in in medicine, um, we tend to call organic diseases or or medical diseases disorders which you can originally see under a microscope, uh, but there be some physical manifestation to it that that if you look at a organ at a slice of time, you could differentiate a diseased organ from a non-diseased organ. And I would maintain that if you took someone who had an addiction and you looked at their brains, there wouldn't be any slice of time where you could say this brain is fundamentally different from that brain. Now, if you look at the behavior of neurons over time, dynamic changes, you might see things that correlate with what we would call addictive behavior. But there's no specific organic pathology to say this is an addicted brain versus a brain that's not addicted. So I don't know, not everyone would agree with me. So if you taught, listen to Nora Balco at NIDA or other uh, professionals in the field, they like to call addiction a brain disease. And I think the reason for it is, I don't think they really believe it's just a brain disease, but they're trying to contrast the notion that it's a disease of willpower, a disease of some defect in character and try to bring addiction more into the medical side as opposed to the moral side. But I think if you really press people on it, they'll say that addiction involves the behavior of an organism, not the behavior of a particular cell. Okay. Um, and so we have a question in chat there about uh, what about depression, bipolar, those sorts of mental wellness conditions, would those be considered a disease? Well, I, I, I mean, there's been a lot of good mileage for looking at these disorders as, quote, brain diseases, because it encourages people to take medicines to treat them. It tends to remove stigma associated with having it. But uh, again, if you look at a depressed brain versus a non-depressed brain, brain, I challenge you to find the organic pathology that differentiates the two. And the same thing with bipolar disorder. Um, 
again, if you really wanted to find someone with depression, I think you have to look at a whole person and how they interact with the environment. Same thing with bipolar disorder, that there's no such thing as a bipolar neuron. Actually, there are such things as bipolar neurons, but they have nothing to do with bipolar disease. It has to do with other physiologic processes. But you can't show me a brain of someone who suffers from one of those disorders that's fundamentally different than the brain of someone who doesn't have those disorders. So it's really, those are really behavioral disorders as well. Are they learned? I'm not sure they're clearly as learned as something like addiction. For me, that's a learned disease fundamentally. I think depression, bipolar disorder, not so much a learned disorder, but that would be fun to talk about at some time, at some point. Yeah, great, great. Uh, so we've got now another quiz. Um, this one has some more difficult questions on it. And again, folks, this test is a test of how well we're doing getting the information across to you. I would say from the first poll, it looks like we're doing a reasonably good job. There's maybe one or two little gaps there, but probably a B. <laughs> so... Uh, <laughs> Well, hopefully we'll do better on this, but I will say this is complicated, tricky stuff that's coming up. So if you don't get the correct answer, do not feel bad because we will review it and then we'll probably retest again. I, I didn't give Steve the answer, so we'll see how Steve does. <laughs> <laughs> there could be some incorrect answers. Yes, that's right. All right. So okay. let's see if we go ahead and we're going to launch this poll number two. Uh, and we'll we'll let that run. It's uh, <laughs> ten questions, so we'll give. I I don't think anyone will get all these perfect, but we'll see. We we'll give like five minutes or so for this because this is tricky stuff. We can take a little. We can take a little break while people answer the questions. <laughs> Is everybody able to do that? If you could just pop in the chat, if you've got a problem with doing it, I'm a co-host, so I can't actually see it correctly. Yeah, I don't obviously. see anybody answering the question, so I wonder if we have a problem here. Nick, Nick is saying you can do it. Uh, That's okay. what I'm seeing. I'm not seeing anybody, any answers happening. Uh, you got to read through this. This is this is a tricky one. Okay, but I should see. Yeah, that's Where's taking it? me quite a bit. So maybe we just need a few more minutes. But okay. you're actually seeing like, because I'm showing zero of 19 people participated. No answers to any question. I, I got okay. one now. I just got one. Oh, okay, so it takes takes a while. Okay, you have to complete the whole quiz before you start getting results. Got it. Okay. That's it. <laughs> that's we're new at this <laughs> we'll, oh, get okay. we'll get better this is the first time we've done this so <laughs> ah. oh my <laughs> oh how many items are there here oh. these are great joe and 
Joe and Steve, these are fantastic. I haven't been able, it's Hannah talking here. Hello. Hi, Hannah. Um, I, haven't, I haven't been able to attend any of the, um, any of the previous um, classes, so I'm not answering anything, but it's, I'm feeling very unfortunate right now because I'd love to be able to give you feedback. I just, you know, would be, it would be a shot in the dark and certainly not representative of, of what you've presented. So I'm just, um, I'm Actually, just sitting back and listening. It's okay. It's okay. I can Hannah, see there's because... a wide distribution of answers. So. Right. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through each of the questions and we're going to discuss them and then we're going to do a re-quiz afterwards. We can relaunch it so you can take it and we can see how well you learned the second time around <laughs> or the first time around uh, for you, second time for everybody else. Now you've got me, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, like the, I like the last question. Steve, you've been able to go through the uh, quiz. I I I went through, and what I did was I put what I thought were the correct answers. So, it's but what I'm seeing is on the previous one. <laughs> well, there's. One question that's untitled. So that, that, it, these things, it, it's not the easiest thing to um, load these things in. Um, but what I saw on the previous quiz was I had put the correct answer in. And it showed at the bottom of that quiz, but uh, at the bottom of each question. But I'm not seeing that at the bottom of each one of these questions. So. You still have my email, though. It's it's oh. memorialized. You'll know how I did. <laughs> <laughs> we can look at my email and see how I did. <laughs> Untitled question. Yeah, I don't know. They, it, like I said, it's, it's not the easiest thing to try yeah. to edit. Uh, so I'm, I, I'll... Uh, so everyone gets a point for that one. Yeah, everybody gets a point for that one. <laughs> That's my gimme. <laughs> oh, well, as host you, host, you can't complete it. Okay, I can unhost you. Let's see. Uh, maybe I can do that. No, I guess I can't. Once I... Hmm. Hello, I'm trying to figure out how I can chat. Okay, we're in the pro. Actually, you did you just join us? I I I've been answering your questions, but I'm trying to figure oh. out how I can chat. Oh, okay. Like how you can how you can do what? Chat or send you a message. Oh, oh, go into the chat. Uh, like I'm trying to figure out how I can type you my questions. 
Right. If you go down, down, you should. Do you have a dot 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 more on the right hand side down on the bottom of your screen by the leave button? Oh, it's up top. Okay. There's one that has a pull down. Okay. Menu. See, and then I can and say check. Say ch yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Sure. I think we have most of the people have answered something. Yeah, we have. Um, we've got twenty two on, and there's a number of us that can't do it. There's about oh. four or five that can't do it, and I don't know about people that came in a little bit if after we've launched it. Um, is there anybody that out there that hasn't completed the quiz at this point? I'm not seeing anybody that says that they haven't. So we could probably go ahead and whoop. Okay. No. We we probably just go ahead and end it. Okay. And start the discussion. Okay. So now we'll share the results. Great. Oh, yeah. oh you, does have you, go. you have answers. correct answer both A and C. Okay. <laughs> you can see if I'm right correct. or right. So <laughs> One of the things that makes the field complicated is terminology. And so one of the things we've been doing over the first four weeks is helping to teach you a new language to discuss things. And one of the things that makes it challenging in the field is every few years, they keep changing the terminology. And so everything that you learned, you have to sort of relearn. So the notion of instrumental learning, which of course is the relationship between your behavior and some outcome has been fined has been sort of uh, identified in different ways over the years. So in the past, it was associated with Skinnerian learning. So Skinnerian learning and instrumental learning are the same thing. Classical conditioning is actually an association between two external stimuli. That's where you get conditioned responses, conditioned stimuli. And so that doesn't have to do with your behavior. It has to do with the environment, associations in the environment. So instrumental learning is not classical conditioning. Operant conditioning is another phrase that refers to instrumental learning. So at one point they call it operant conditioning, then they call it scenario learning. But for purposes of discussion in here, we just want to call all those instrumental learning, which means the correct answers are scenario learning, operant conditioning, or both A and C. So that is the correct answer here. And then all of the above, again, Classical conditioning is different than instrumental learning. So those are two different processes. Does that make sense to people? Do people understand the difference between instrumental learning and classical conditioning? As I can offer I can offer up some tips on how I how I remember it because I've complained that it's very complicated and confusing. So I go like this and I say, instrument if i were going to play an instrument i would have to learn how to play that instrument it's not something that would be natural and that would involve my frontal cortex my prefrontal cortex okay that would be a voluntary choice that would be something that i would be wanting to learn because i want to learn how to play this you know play music from this thing uh, as opposed to classical conditioning, which is, I just always remember that classical is Pavlovian. Okay, so, and and when I think Pavlov and I think classical, then I start thinking limbic lizard brain, you know, all that stuff that I, is involuntary and reflexive. So I try to make two buckets, okay, that go beyond just the phrase instrumental learning or classical conditioning, but embrace what you know, that it's voluntary versus involuntary, that it's prefrontal cortex versus limit. And when I look at it as two buckets like that, it became easier for me. And then I just remembered that instrumental, and then I think of Skinnery and I think of Skinner boxes, okay? And I just, it just that's a training box for rats, okay? So I know that that's the same thing and opera. And I, that's just memory thing. I mean, you just kind of have to remember those three terms all mean the same thing. But the fact is instrumental learning is 
voluntary kinds of learning and behaviors, voluntary behaviors that you do to get a reward versus involuntary. How's that? Great. Does that, does that help folks? I guess we'll see. <laughs> yeah. Okay, next question. Pavlovian conditioning is also known as Skinnerian learning? No. Classical conditioning? Yes. Operant conditioning? No. So operant conditioning and Skinnerian learning refer to instrumental learning. And A and C, that would not be correct. All of the above, I guess, would not be correct. So correct answer is classical conditioning. Yes. So most, half the people got that one right. So again, classical conditioning and Pavlovian conditioning are the same thing. Instrumental learning, Skinnerian learning, operant learning, those are the same thing. And the two are different. And as Steve pointed out, one involves sort of more voluntary behavior, prefrontal cortex. The other is more limbic brain, um, sort of more primitive brain kinds of uh, associations between things out in the environment, not things that you have volitional control over. And I'm just trying to make sure everybody has the same terminology. So when we talk about things, we can talk about it from the same basis. Okay. So in classical, con classical conditioning is a learning process that links a neutral stimulus with a biologically important stimulus. That sounds pretty good. Links a behavior with the consequence of that behavior. That doesn't sound very good. That sounds more like instrumental learning to me. Is under conscious voluntary control? No, it's probably more not conscious. It's again, classical conditioning is like uh, when Pavlo trained the dog to salivate to the sound of the bell. The salivation wasn't under conscious or voluntary control. It happened reflexively and is independent, has no effect on instrumental learning. Well, that's not true. That probably uh, people didn't understand the significance of that. And we'll get to that one later, but they do have interactions with each other. Just to complicate the story, classical conditioning can affect instrumental learning in very specific ways. But the correct answer is links a neutral stimulus with a biologically important stimulus. Does that make some sense to people? Okay, untitled, everyone got that one right. <laughs> Looks like choice one is winning. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah. Good choice. All right. So instrumental learning is a learning process that links a neutral stimulus with a biologically important stimulus. What's that? That's classical conditioning or Pavlovian conditioning. Links a behavior with the consequence of that behavior. That sounds pretty good to me is reflexive or unconscious, not under voluntary control. Again, the, the classic example of instrumental learning is like a, when a rat presses a lever to get access to food. If you're hungry, then you're motivated to get food and the rat knows how to get food by pressing the lever, he can present food to themselves. And um, so what about A and C? So is a neutral stimulus? No, unconscious, no. So the correct answer should be uh, links of behavior and a consequence. So hopefully people understand that. Okay. Interactions between instrumental learning and classical conditioning can be, so this is a tough question, but very important question. So can it lead to behaviors that appear irrational? I think yes, cause motivation to engage in a behavior. I think that's a good yes. Increases craving for alcohol and other drugs. I think that's a yes. So all of the above would be the correct answer. And I guess most people got that. So when we talked about the, um, the misbehavior of organisms, like I guess that was last week, we talked about how there's important interactions between our classical conditioning can 
the con conditioned response of a classically conditioned stimulus can motivate or cause craving to want to get drugs. When you walk into a bar, the bar can act as a conditioned stimulus to motivate the person to go and order a drink or can increase one's craving to want to go uh, get a drink. And that's all because of interactions between classical conditioning and instrumental learning. Hopefully that makes sense to people. Okay, good. Okay, so extinction. So that's really important for those of us who are doing the Sinclair method. It all involves extinction, right? So that involves a weakening of the association between some behavior and some outcome. I think that's supposed to be outcome. That sounds pretty good to me. Engaging in a behavior and blocking the reward for that behavior. Yeah, that sounds pretty good to me. So those would be two examples of you have a behavior and outcome and you're blocking the reward to that outcome. That sounds like extinction of some, everyone, instrumental. Instrumental. <laughs> instrumental, right? Behavior. And what's this last one? Presenting a condition stimulus and blocking the, I don't know what it's supposed to say, the reward or yes. the outcome. Uh, yeah. That sounds like extinction of Steve. Uh, you know, I had a little question on this one myself, okay. but because Great. you had an unconditioned, I think it says it blocks an unconditioned, yes, unconditioned stimulus. So presenting a conditioned stimulus or trigger and blocking the unconditioned stimulus or reward. Yes. And I wondered, I thought, okay, so that must be a case where the unconditioned, the stimulus hasn't been learned yet. Is that correct? Well, if it's, so if it's a conditioned stimulus. stimulus, then there's already some association between a neutral stimulus and some reward. Okay. So, so possible is the U.S. in that question or answer incorrect? Unconditioned uh, stimulus. I I would say that if you here's an example, the bar you walk into a bar which has been associated with alcohol and getting the buzz from alcohol, the bar itself can become a conditioned stimulus associated with the buzz from alcohol, right? Right. So right. the Conditioned stimulus could elicit a conditioned response, which I believe in this case would be craving or motivation to want to drink. Okay. From classical so if, conditioning. That's classical conditioning. So then if you walk into a bar and you have a drink, but you don't get any buzz from it, that should cause extinction of the classical, of the conditioned stimulus. So when we use the Sinclair method, not only is there extinction of the instrumental behavior of picking up the drink, that's what most of us think of when we think of extinction, there's also extinction of the cues associated with drinking. So there's two extinction processes that are going on at that time. So all of the above would be the correct answer, I think. Yeah. And that's because there's extinction of classical conditioning and extinction of instrumental learning when you present an unconditioned stimulus, but no reward, when you block the effects of it, or you don't present the unconditioned stimulus at all. So let me ask you a question. Should we really be thinking of things in the context of a conditioned instrumental stimulus and a conditioned instrumental response versus a conditioned classical stimulus versus a conditioned classical response do you need that modifier is that important to understand that um can you go th through that again with me i, I think so, i understand but i want to go make sure i understand okay so if, if we just say it's a conditioned stimulus it could be a conditioned stimulus that's either instrumental or classical type of conditioning 
It's, oh, I see. You only use the word conditional that, stimulus in a general term. Well, no. It, in this particular case, it is used like generally presenting a condition stimulus. I'm wondering, is it more correct to say it is a conditioned instrumental stimulus, is a conditioned instrumental response, so that you know what kind of stimulus and response relationship there is? In other words, could a conditioned instrumental response be associated with a conditioned classical stimulus? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Yeah. <laughs> so you're using a, some new phrases in there that I'm not sure I understand what they mean. Well, that's what I'm trying to understand is that whether when you say conditioned stimulus, how do you know Go ahead. Whether you're talking about instrumental conditioning or classical conditioning. Yeah. So if all you know is it's a condition stimulus. A condition stimulus refers to some external stimulus paired with some uh, reward, outcome, biologically important stimulus, something like the high from drinking, a food pellet. But the condition stimulus is like a tone, a bell, it's something outside your body. Instrumental is an association between something that you do and some outcome, like press a lever, pull a chain, drink a beer. So, so that that's what what differentiates those two different types of learning. But one could say, and I think that's what you're saying, is that in point of fact, both kinds of learning reflect associations between stimulus and response. In the one case, it's an external stimulus. We call that a conditioned stimulus. In the other case, it's a response and an outcome. And we call that instrumental learning. But you can look at the response itself as like a conditioned stimulus. It sounds like that's what you're referring to. Okay. Okay. I think I understand what you're saying now. Yeah. And not to get too deep in the woods, but there's some people who do look at conditioned responses as very as very analogous to conditioned stimuli the only difference is one you produced the other it was produced outside outside yeah okay so conditioned stimulus is essentially a trigger yes exactly valerie you get it beautiful so when people use the word trigger they're referring to condition stimuli. Okay. Both classical conditioning and instrumental learning involve. Yeah. So here we go. An association between some stimulus or behavior and some outcome. That sounds pretty good. <clears throat> the simple pairing of a stimulus or behavior with some outcome. Remember when we talked about the Cayman blocking effect, you could have a pairing, but there was no association formed because there was an, a prior association formed with some other stimulus, which blocked learning about the new stimulus, which was now paired with it. So just pairing is not enough. Is it an unconditioned process? Um not necessarily because instrumental learning can be very conscious. I'm hungry, so I'm going to uh, open up a can of beans. Is it always a conscious process? No, it's not always a conscious process because with classical conditioning, it can be unconscious that you're not aware of it. So the best answer there is the first one. Okay, but just to confuse everybody, here we go. According to the Wagner Escorla model, new learning involves. This is a good one. Let's see if you have the right answer here. Oh, yes. <laughs> good job. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. So, does it involve the strength of an outcome? Yes. So, you can have a strong uh, outcome that's really pleasing, or you could have a weak outcome. And so, the strength of uh, new learning depends on how strong the the outcome is, the reward, the unconditioned stimulus is. Stronger ones lead to stronger learning. Weaker ones would lead to weaker learning. How much of the outcome is expected? Yes. Yeah, so remember that term in the 
Wagner score Lomano, which was the difference between the strength of the outcome, the strength of the reward, minus how much you expected it. And when that number is high, you learn a lot. When the number is low, you don't learn very much. When a stimulus or behavior is followed by something surprising. And so that's just another way of saying uh, what we said in the previous sentence. When the difference between something expected versus what you actually got is high, then that makes it surprising. It was an unexpected reward. And, and that has an important effect in terms of new learning. When it's an expected reward, you don't learn very much. When it's unexpected, you learn a lot. And how much attention is supposed to be, yo, well, that in Philly we call it yo, but most people would say you are paying to the stimulus or the behavior. And um, so that's important. And that was one of the things that we we're going to get to tonight, but we probably won't have time to get to that. But uh, Steve, you pointed this out last week that when you're paying attention to something, you learn a lot about it. And when you're not paying attention, you don't learn very much about it. And it turns out there's important uh, ways of understanding what are the conditions in which you tend to pay attention to certain stimuli versus ignoring others. So that's that's also important. So the best answer is all of the above. Is that pretty clear to people? And again, I'm I'm teaching people I'm teaching you a new language, a new way of thinking about this. And, and it's hard. And I have to say that by the end of this semester, you will know as much as many treatment providers. And you will have the language to be able to talk to them, probably teach them a little bit about understanding addiction from a new light. So this is hard stuff. But I believe me, when you get all this, it's going to make understanding addiction so much easier and so much easier to communicate to people because you will have a firm foundation of all these principles and the right terminology to talk about them. And also have the tools to examine our own behaviors. Exactly. To speed up our own recoveries. I mean, that's definitely part of this is is the second part is to exercise agency. Yes, yes, exactly. Great. So number 10, okay. What's the best answer to the following question? So according to Volpicelli, what is an addictions expert opinion without any supporting evidence and $4.95 worth? So, so some people would say, well, a lot, since an expert must know what they're talking about. Well, no one answered that. Okay. Worth telling other people how should they should approach their recovery. So because they read it in a book and there was some expert, people feel compelled that they can tell other people how they should do it. One person said yes to that. It's worth a lot if the expert opinion is the same as my opinion, a lot of people sort of believe that, that they're looking for evidence to support what they already believe. Not worth much if the expert opinion disagrees with what I believe, or I think I had in there even what Volpicelli agrees with. So somebody uh, agreed with that statement. Or it's worth a, uh, a grande pumpkin latte at Starbucks. And that's the correct answer. Because that's four dollars and ninety-five cents buys you a grand pumpkin latte at Starbucks, at least at my Starbucks. Okay. So just because an expert says something, if they don't have the evidence to support it, that's not worth very much. Don't just listen to somebody because they're a so-called expert. Ask them for the evidence. And again, at the end of the semester, you'll be able to analyze things as well as many so-called experts. And I want you to be able to form your own opinions about things, not even listen to everything that I say or Steve says. You think about it and look for the evidence to support your views and be willing to be surprised when your preconceived notions turn out not to support the evidence. And for me, that's not disappointing. That's fun. It's fun to learn new things. So be open to being surprised. So... That's you got to be surprised to learn, right? You got to be surprised to pay important. attention to it. 
Yeah, be attention to the surprising things. Out of the yeah, environment. That's, that's what you got to do. All right. So what we'll do now is we let's. Uh, I'm gonna download the results from that, and then I'm, I'm going to go ahead and relaunch it, and we'll see if there's been new learning that happened. So. Um, here we go. Folks, you get another shot at it. Should be able to go through faster at this time. See, people have been very patient with all this. Do we want to cover any new information tonight or give people a chance to ask questions? I think we're going to have about a half an hour left. Um, I think you wanted to cover some stuff on meta learning, and did... we didn't want to die. Slides. Yeah, I don't think we wanted to dive into opponent process model no. at this point. So I would say, let's see how the results go here. If there's some questions that we still need to go back and address, if there's still confusion, particularly between instrumental and con classical conditioning. Okay, and then um, we, can, we have a couple options. We can launch the third poll, which is the one that has the narrative in it. Mm. okay and we could discuss that we could discuss the couple slides that you have there and the results and any other questions that folks have well if people want to comment in the chat what would you like to do I'm, I'm happy to answer any general questions you have or we could <clears throat> uh, present a sort of a scenario and then you can have a chance to use some of the terminology that we've been going over tonight or, and the third thing is I can go over some new material. We're about, we're roughly about half the results in here. So let's, let's let them finish up the quiz. And okay. We'll, so we have a, about two or three different options we can take. <laughs> Okay, we have uh, Valerie wants to see the third quiz. Okay. 
that's kind of a um, almost a mixture of what you described, where it, it talks about a scenario, and we can talk about the um, various aspects of it. So and Henry wants to see the third because I think he, he 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 got lost on the second one, and I don't know how to make it available to him again. So. I can hear people saying, I didn't think there was going to be quizzes in this thing. <laughs> <laughs> Last week there's math and this week there's quizzes. Oh my goodness. Uh, right. <laughs> He's taking uh, a semester thing way too I seriously. Think, <laughs> I think we're stalled out at 44%, it looks like. So I think we'll just go ahead and end this because we've had it open five minutes now. So let's do that and let's take a look. We'll share the results. So we have most people saying A and C. That's good. Most people saying classical conditioning. That's good. Excellent. Yep. Class is learning process, behavior and consequence. So we get that evenly between the. Uh, okay. Uh, so yeah. Let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah. Okay. So the neutral stimulus with the biological important uh, stimulus, okay? In that particular case, what I would be thinking of is I'm thinking of Pavlov's dog salivating. The salivation is an important biological process for the dog to prepare its mouth and so forth to get ready to be able to eat and swallow food and so forth, uh, taste it, do all the things that it needs to do with it. So... Um, that would seem like that is classical conditioning versus the second one, which would be a behavior. And we talked about behavior. And if you use my model, I was saying, I want to learn how to play an instrument. Okay. If I'm going to, and if I'm going to learn how to play an instrument, it's, because it's a conscious decision. It's something I have to learn how to do. It's not natural. So the second one links a behavior or consequence for that behavior would be instrumental learning. That's how I think of the two. I'm going to try to keep track of them. Okay. So in this particular case, classical conditioning is a learning process that A, links a neutral stimulus with the biologically important. Mm -hmm. Yep. Pavlov's dog, salivating. Hopefully that's clear for folks. Is there anybody that that's not clear for it's okay if it's not just let us know yeah okay we, we'll probably have some more examples of it as we go down the question instrumental learning is um links of behavior and a consequence yep yeah instrumental really links links of behavior with the consequence and interactions can engage behavior, increase craving, and all of the above. I still like all of the above. Mm -hmm. And extinction, all of the above. Yep, we like that one. It's involve association. So I like the, the first answer. And the simple pairing often produces uh, associations, but sometimes doesn't. In the case of the blocking experiment, there's an example where there's a pairing, but not no association is formed. It, it blocks learning. And wagner scorla <clears throat> all of the above. Sounds like the good answer. Most people got that. And uh, number 10, so, they all got that now. <laughs> people like the grand, the pumpkin latte at Starbucks. So good. Yeah. Very good. nice. So it looks like we had that one little confusion still between the classical involuntary, right? The classical Pavlovian salivating dog, which has no control over its salivation, versus me learning how to play the piano because I want to learn how to play the piano. 
because I can't play any other instruments. <laughs> and, uh, and I just blame the field for it because why do you have two terms to describe one process, classical conditioning and Pavlovian conditioning? And on the other side, you have instrumental learning, Skinnerian learning, operant learning, Opera three be, yeah. terms that all describe the same thing. So the field makes it really difficult for you. And I apologize for the, the way the field does it. But if we can keep it to instrumental learning and classical conditioning and keep that straight, that would be great. All right. So I want to download those results and we can go to quiz three, which is the scenarios. See where I can launch that. All right. And now I don't even know if these answers are right on this one here. <laughs> so we'll find out. <laughs> I haven't seen, have I seen these? Well, you saw some of it. This is oh, just okay. like snippet, snippets of a narrative. Okay. This Got is it. going on and I asked a question about it here. Okay, okay. good. So we got three questions. Yeah. No, oh, good. I want to hear your answer, Steve. <laughs> yeah. Well, I started writing this at three o'clock in the morning, yeah, so I take it. I, I can't take any too much responsibility for no. it. No. <laughs> I woke up at three o'clock and I said, "Shit, I don't have a scenario." <laughs> and I started making up terms like class. <laughs> So we'll have a good discussion here. Good discussion. <laughs> That's good stuff. That's good stuff. <clears throat> And there's a whole longer scenario here that we can pick apart if we feel like doing that too. It gets very complicated as you start to read through, through these things. We start to really understand this interplay of classical conditioning and instrumental conditioning and that they overlap and like, where's the one taken over? What, you know, where's the now track zone and all of that, you know, yes. <laughs> and, and breaking habits and so forth. So. Um, we get seven of 17. I think we had eight of 17 on the last go. So we'll let it run for a couple more seconds here. We're almost up to three minutes. It's a minute question. That should be fine. I take no responsibility for these answers. <laughs> <laughs> Share the results. Okay. <laughs> now, so I, live I, music. I, go ahead. I, I was going to say, does it make sense to unmute people and they can yep. talk about what they and think? Well, anybody, anybody can unmute themselves. That's oh, probably the easiest thing. Anybody that wants to speak up, go ahead and speak up. If it turns out that we're talking over each other, then we'll use raised hands. Okay. But for the moment, I think we'll just, you know, people can just talk about it. Feel free. Okay, so the first question, live music is pounding, two for one happy hour. Tim slaps his buddy on the back as he <clears throat> joins his group of friends who beat him to the bar. In the usual ritual, Tim has to buy a round of shots since he was the last to arrive. So, scenario. So, Tim buying a round of shots is an example of, is that an unconditioned stimulus? 
I don't know what do people think. Does it does it make sense? There's an unconditioned stimulus buying around. For me, I don't know. That sounds like that's a behavior. Yeah, it's probably been reinforced by maybe the the social approval, but maybe also drinking the beer. Other people might have a, a different interpretation of that. So, what would you say that that is? I would say that's an example of a instrumental response, that that is a voluntary behavior that the person engages in that's probably rewarded by, uh, in the scenario that you've identified, uh, that you probably get social approval for buying everyone a beer. And they probably smile at him and pat him on the back, and they give him a lot of social approval for that. Um and maybe there's some part of it that, you know, when he drinks the beer, that that's pretty tasty too. So that reward, that also rewards buying a drink, but buying the round probably has to do with the social approval. So that would be an example that, of an that, instrumental response. That that was my thinking too. I thought it was an instrumental response. It was voluntary. To, it's voluntary because he could say, no, I'm not going to do it. I don't don't have any money or whatever uh but he's doing it for the approval it's the it's the norm it's what they do whoever's the last <laughs> one in has to pay for it you know uh and of course he gets a buzz off of it too there's no yeah you know, no not yeah. bad there so so the last answer would be the correct answer in that case yeah and then the okay. the warmth of the tequila followed by a slug of cold beer nice burp drains the beer orders a second so Let's look, take the first part first. So he takes the drink, he orders a drink, buys it, it arrives, and then he drinks it and then gets an effect from it, which was he felt it was cold, that it was satisfying. Theoretically, it was pleasurable. So what would that be an example of that part? Is that a voluntary behavior? Was it classically conditioned? Was it unconditioned? I can hazard a guess, but I wonder if anybody else would like to take a shot at it. Anybody feel like they want to give it a go? Guess not. Okay, I'm going to go with classical conditioning on the taste and satisfaction of having the shot and the beer. Yeah, so if we're focused on the taste... I think that would be a good example of a classically conditioned response, right? A conditioned response. Um, if you talk about the effect of the alcohol per se, that's not conditioned. That's the, the natural unconditioned effects of the alcohol itself. So you can make a case that the buzz you get from the alcohol is a unconditioned response, but everything that occurred before that, the taste, the environment, the context, that all became conditioned, classically conditioned to the buzz. And so that would be the conditioned, uh, classically conditioned stimulus causing a conditioned response. If that makes some sense. Yes. Now, the particular question here, though, was the second beer. So he yeah, drains so the, question the beer, is, okay, and he orders a second beer before he even realizes it. So ordering the beer would be an example of what? This is where it could be it, I could see it could go one of it could go either way. It could be classical because it just doesn't even think about it. He just drains the first one and just orders the second one because the first one's empty. Okay. Uh, or it could be there more may be more thought put into it. Okay. In which case then it would be instrumental. But in, in this particular case, I put the modification in there. He orders a second before he even realizes it. Got it. Make it clear that that was 
a classic condition response. Okay. Yeah. So I what I would say is, I, and I understand where you're coming from, but what I would say is that because he has control over the stimulus, he ordered. The, he was the person working the the lights, if you will. He was the person who had control of saying it or not. That it was an instrumental behavior. But I think what you're pointing out is that it was so reflexive, so automatic, so under, I would say, stimulus control over that he just had a tasty beer, that that highly motivated the instrumental response. We might say that there would be an example of classical conditioning elicited the motivation to engage in that instrumental behavior. So that's how okay. I would just break it down. I, I could buy that. Uh, the point there that I was really just trying to get at was that um, over time, our behaviors get automated. Yes. Mm -hmm. About 70% about of all our behaviors are automatic behaviors, not, refl not reflex, okay? A reflex is different. That's uncontrolled. Without even you know, thinking you know, about it. So it does become just a automatized. Yes. Okay. And so that's what I was trying to get at here was that it's so automatic at that point that it yes. become it it has floated out of the realm. But but you're right. It's tethered to instrumental because he's yes. going to make a decision. He has to place the order. He has to give a signal. You know to refill. Okay. So that's a voluntary behavior. That's for sure. But it's very classically conditioned in in terms of it, the ingrained habit yeah no i hear you i hear and you so so then what we want to think about is how do we uncondition that how do we unlearn that that's the point of all of this right isn't the point of all of this trying to figure out how we got there to figure out how we get out of there Exactly. Yeah, no, you're right. But uh, I would say that, that that's probably an example where the context had so much control over the behavior that it became, we, we would say, uh, unconscious, reflexive or whatever, that the person didn't put much thought into it. And there there is a whole literature on uh, how certain instrumental behaviors come under stimulus control over you know, how external stimuli can have control over your own behaviors so that it becomes automatic. So right. we, that's an example, stimulus control. Okay, so now let's introduce into this scenario now Trexon. Mm -hmm. Okay, because what, what's going to happen then is that this ingrained habit to order another drink, um, it, it's... If this is the first excursion with the naltrexone, there's going to be a surprise. We're back to Wagner Rescorla model here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. And particularly if we're paying attention to that surprise, then we're going to start to move the we're going to start to move towards extinction and what that is in effect, the erasure of this automatized behavior. That's the unlearning of it. The two correct? things will undergo extinction. The instrumental response of ordering the drink won't be rewarded. Right. And the context that brought the instrumental response under stimulus control will also not be rewarded. So those two things should lose their grip. Right. But one of the things that you point out is person needs to be paying attention to this right and so if they do this and it be, it's so automatic and they do it they might just say boy i didn't get a buzz what's different and they may not attribute it to the fact that they ordered a beer or the context they might say what was different here is that i took the damn naltrexone an hour ago so that's the bad guy here that's why i didn't get the buzz and instead of having extinction to that automatic behavior, you might get extinction that I don't want to take the naltrexone. So again, and that's so, getting into the weeds a bit, but. 
Well, no, that's an important set of weeds to be in, though, because compliance is the big issue. I mean, it's the number one issue, let's face it. Yeah, so, so it's important for people to be able to recognize that nuance that you just described there. Well, I I could use some data now because this is one of those times where I don't know, okay? So this is even yeah. beyond me acting as an expert. This is me acting as a naive observer. What are people's experiences when they take naltrexone and drink? What Are they being aware of the fact that, you know, I'm not getting a buzz, therefore it doesn't make much sense for me to drink? Is it that the context loses its ability to bring on craving or do people in their mind have an association that now Trexim is a bad thing because I don't get the buzz that I expected? What, what are people's experience? And I'm going to ask people to please share here on this because as you all know, I have no personal experience with now Trexim myself, I'm never having actually gone through the Sinclair method. So please folks uh, <laughs> and Dr. V hasn't either. So the only thing I could always tell you is that people, the first word that people always say is that it was weird. That's their first experience. Go ahead, Mary. You should be able to unmute yourself. Go, Marika, go ahead. Hi. Yeah. Um. So I'm glad you brought this up because um, I remember the first time I ever took it, <clears throat> excuse me. And I um, like opened a bottle of wine and I literally like took a picture because I, I I drank like that much of the wine. Like it was like a quarter of a glass. And um, it was like, it wasn't, I was being mindful and I knew, you know, what was supposed to happen, but I really felt like there was this automatic, um, almost not quite a repulsion, but like an off switch. So it was like a couple sips that tasted good. And I, in my experience, I usually do get a little bit of a buzz, like not a lot, like I, I would have before, but I, I would still get a little bit of an effect from the alcohol. Um, but it literally was like, like, just like my body said, stop. It was amazing. Um, and then I just wanted to add to that if maybe other people can speak, but I wanted, I was curious if we could maybe talk about, um, just the fact of like, um, over time when, when you're doing the Sinclair method, if, if anyone else feels like wondering, like, I guess I had an experience where I first started it and, and was compliant for just to, just maybe like a couple months and then I moved and then my life changed and I was like, ah, I don't need naltrexone anymore. So then I, you know, went for a year without it. And then when I started again, um, I've been ultra compliant since since starting again but it's not even an option like my brain actually will think about drinking and then I'll think eh, but I gotta take the pill and it, there's like no question that I wouldn't take the pill like I'm wondering how that works like does that make sense because that to me is amazing that like I like at this point now I feel so stable like I've been alcohol free for a week which is like the max so far and I'm like there's no way I wouldn't take that pill. Like there's just no way. So I don't know. That's bringing up yeah, a whole no, nother. What, point, what you're describing true. is sort of uh, what we're trying to understand that this is the golden goose. That's what we want to get to. What is it that clicks for people that they don't take it because they have to, they take it because they want to. It It's, People, there's nothing inherently rewarding about taking naltrexone. It blocks something that would normally make you feel good. But I think for some people, at least in my experience and working with patients, that particularly after they've been on naltrexone for a while, they begin to see the rewards of not being stuck in that addictive cycle, that the addictive cycle itself becomes unpleasant, and people don't want to go back there. And by taking naltrexone, it blocks them from getting stuck in that addictive cycle. And it opens up a whole smorgasbord of new rewards that replace the compulsion to drink. That's not the most important thing in your life anymore. And you see the drinking as something that's a threat to other 
positive things in your life and you don't want to go back there. And so you see the naltrexone is a good thing because it keeps you from going back there. At least that's how I think about it. But again, I'm open to the data that you provide. Well, what's curious to me is, <clears throat> excuse me, why, why my brain doesn't say, well, let me just try to have some wine without the naltrexone now and see what happens. Like why, right. why, why doesn't yes. it do that? You know, is it because I'm in this community and another community and I'm like very aware of like, I don't want to do that anymore. Or is it like, there's something to do with the habit or the naltrexone even, or I mean, this maybe a couple of things, but it's just very interesting. Cause I did it. Cause I did that before, right? Like before I said, oops, nope, I think I'm good. I don't really want to do this right now. And then I went back out drinking. So I don't think you, I, you know, I mean, knock on wood, but I don't think I'll do that again. Yeah. You know, who knows what it is inside of you, but it is inside of you. Okay. Because I can tell you for sure, there are people that have, you know, gone with the, well, you know, what if I just take a little bit less or what if I just drink a little bit longer? I mean, that it seems like a lot of people have to push the limit. And when they do, they usually come back and say, that was really terrible. Okay. I don't want to do that. And usually it doesn't take more than once or twice before people figure out that, no, nah, uh, this is just, and they, some people I'm sure, you know, may just decide, no, this is just not for me now, right now. Okay. I want to still get the buzz and I still want to, that's what I'm going to do. You know, that's their choice, you know, but there's a lot of people that say, I don't like that. It, it, it's, it's, I, I can definitely relate to what, Dr. V is saying about the other things become more important. I mean, I don't have naltrexone. Uh, if I were ever going to drink, I would take naltrexone for sure. But I can tell you that my motivation for not drinking is that I have many other things in my life that give me joy that drinking would just get in the way of, and I don't have any desire for that to get in the way of it. Okay. So that's inside of me. Okay. And that's not necessarily inside somebody else. So you can't really answer that question, but you can, it's definitely worth spending the time looking inside yourself to understand that because not only will it help you with this particular issue, but it helps you with other issues in life too. Right. Once you can understand yeah. that it's a motivation Absolutely. thing. It's really is a motivation thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thank you. I just want to learn how someone gets there because if I can teach someone else to get there, it would have a dramatic effect in their recovery. But you have my theory about why someone gets there, but I don't have any data to back that up. And what is your theory? Theory is that people at some point get sick of being on that addictive cycle because it's blocking other things that they enjoy in life. And once they have that freedom of not being in that cycle anymore, they don't want to go back there because it compromises other good things in their life. It reminds me of the experiment with the uh, rat who presses the lever for the brain stimulation. When you give him a choice, he doesn't want to go back in that chamber that has the brain stimulation. The, the, uh, being away from it, being off that cycle is like being on naltrexone. And then people have a choice. They don't want to go back to that state of pressing the lever to get the brain stimulation anymore because it, it just robs them of too many other valuable things in life. That's the theory. Yeah. And I think that that theory is very heavily tied to motivation. Yes. I, I think it, 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 that basically the AUD robs you of motivation yeah. to do anything other than to satisfy what the AUD demands. Yeah. That's the only motivation that's there. Okay. And it narrows the focus. So once you can, and that's why I, I like to make the distinction between forced abstinence and abstinence and willpower and motivation, because I think that forced abstinence and willpower are unfortunately very bad bedfellows, okay? But they are the bedfellows that exist, and that abstinence and motivation go hand in hand. And it's been shown definitely that we succumb to fatigue 
with respect to willpower, okay, that our willpower reduces over time during the course of the day and in the latter part of the day, which is when drinking typically starts to happen, um, willpower is much lower. Okay, so if you're in a forced abstinence situation and relying on willpower versus an abstinence situation, you have chosen this, okay? You are motivated for that, not being forced to do it. This is a choice, okay? And that motivation to see that choice through is far more likely to succeed than a forced situation with willpower. That's that's my theory hmm, that's a good theory <laughs> you need some data yeah I, yeah I, I look at i look at mo motivation as sort of the the judo equivalent okay you lean into your your hmm. uh, you, you lean into the cravings you lean into the to the abstinence versus fighting it with willpower i like you're that resisting it you're you're resisting a forced situation yeah i like that and Parenthetically, I think sometimes people who do say the AA approach where you're not really affecting how alcohol causes you to stay on that addictive cycle, but you recognize that alcohol is going to put you on that addictive cycle. So you do everything within your power to avoid any exposure to the alcohol. And if you don't get exposed to the alcohol again, that sort of works, except you're spending so much energy avoiding the alcohol and cues associated with alcohol that that becomes its own sort of trap for you. If you can't walk into bars anymore, if you can't go to weddings where they're serving alcohol, um, that limits you as well, as opposed to a medicine like naltrexone that blocks the cycle. So, you know, if you take the medicine, you're free to go wherever you want. You're even free to sample alcohol, I guess, if you want. And that's not going to put you back on that addictive cycle. So that's the difference in recovery by just complete abstaining versus that you're not going to get put back on that addictive cycle because of the pharmacologic effect of the, of the naltrexone. So, right. With the caveat that you don't allow the naltrexone to cause you to blame it on the naltrexone okay you know what i mean <laughs> as you just described you just see i, I, I think there's some percent of people who when they go on naltrexone maybe they're on naltrexone because the spouse wants them on it or whatever and they still miss getting the buzz and when they don't get the buzz on naltrexone they blame the naltrexone and find a good excuse not to take the naltrexone right and, you know, we're going to get in, folks, we're going to get into this very soon uh, as we talk about uh, Dr. Volpicelli's Brenda um, treatment system, which really it, it's really cool be, because it it's kind of a rolling set of conditions and needs and, and changing um, recovery aims if you will, as you're going along and adjusting it. It's uh, so a lot of this will come out from that discussion. I'm sure. Um, I think we have one more question. Oh, I'm sorry. In the Let's do scenarios. the third question. So the binge yeah. drinking behavior is probably caused by uh, impulsive behavior or compulsive behavior. And uh, it looks like most people put compulsive behavior. So impulsive behavior it sounds like that's something where there's a conflict between what the limbic brain wants and what the cognitive brain doesn't want you to do, but you act impulsively because uh, the cognitive brain isn't providing, providing much uh, uh, counter reason to not do something. So you just do it impulsively. It's what your bird brain wants to do kind of thing. Compulsive has a flavor that you don't even think about it. There's not even a debate between the logical brain and the emotional brain. It just, it happens without even a, a second thought. I don't know, Steve, is that your thinking about it? That's, yeah, that's, that's pretty much where I was at was that with this question was that 
we get this rise in dopamine. Okay. This is, see, this is a non now drinking situation here. Okay. This is not a TSM drinking situation. Okay. So the person, so Tim is going to drink and he's, he's, as he drinks, he, the good feeling is start to go away. Okay. And he's going to want to get that back. Okay. And, and the, you know, it'll continue to drop faster and faster with him. So it becomes a compulsion really. Got it. So, well, it me... looks like we, we have actually used up our hour and a half. Um, <laughs> did you want to collect some more information? Is there anybody else that wanted to share on the question that Dr. V had about your experience with naltrexone and how you think about it? Well, let me give a sort of a hint of coming attractions then. <clears throat> so far, we've been talking about instrumental learning, classical conditioning, how they interact. And that applies to learning for everyone. But when it comes to addiction, there's something different about it, that <clears throat> the use of something creates the need to use more of it. And that's not necessarily encompassed by all the things that we've been talking about for learning. We have to understand what is, how is it that addictions occur? Why is it that it, how addictions are different than typical learning? And there's a variety of ways people have talked about it. And um, what is a fact is that when you first start using a drug, it produces pleasure and a good feeling. <clears throat> and when you stop using a drug, you feel a little bit uncomfortable. And over time, when you use the drug, you don't even get much of a buzz anymore. But when you stop, you feel terrible. And so while the initial reward for the instrumental behavior of drinking is to get the buzz, over time, often the reward is to take away the withdrawal. We call that negative reinforcement. And we need to understand how this process occurs. And when you talk to scientists, when you talk to clinicians, when you talk to uh, people who understand, quote, how the brain works, there is no good real model for that. There's a lot of interesting theories and there's a lot of interesting data, but there's not a good model for it. And what I like to do is to present a model for it that I think helps encompass the data. Now, when you take the, the behavioral model and try to apply it to the physiology, it doesn't match up one to one. So we don't understand all the physiologic underpinnings of it yet. But I think the model is very helpful as a heuristic to understand addictive behaviors. And so that's the opponent process model of addiction, and I can spend some time talking about that. I have to say that when I've done this in the past, it turns out to be even more complicated than everything we've talked about. So that's why I've been a little bit reluctant to present it so far. And I, I looked it up on YouTube to see how other people have talked about it, and they blew it. They couldn't even explain it correctly. So I have never heard it presented in a way that really encompasses the flavor of it. And if you're patient with me, I like to take another crack at it and you can tell me if it makes any sense to you. But the model that, that as I use it is incredibly useful in, in terms of me understanding what addiction is and in my working with patients. So with your indulgence, I'd like to present that uh, maybe next week. Excellent. Well, then I thank everybody for their feedback on our teaching. Um, I'd say, yeah, we, you know, we, we got a passing grade. We probably need to, you know, emphasize complicated things a little bit more, um, maybe with examples and so forth. And we'll, we'll, uh, take that into consideration, but I, I think it's been pretty successful. I would say, I think there was, there's been a lot of learning that's happened. So I, this is going to be one of those things that, uh, over time, you're going to appreciate it a whole lot more than you appreciate it now, I bet, because things will make more sense to you and you'll be able to understand things in your head 
better. And as you learn the right terminology and hear how other people talk about it, I believe it's something that will grow on you, but we'll see. All right. Thank you. We look forward to seeing everybody again next week. Have a, have a great rest of the evening. Great. All right. Bye. Bye-bye.